So, you want to stop? Well, I do want it to be over with, so... Well, you asked for it. Uncle Tom's Bungalow. Why are you doing this to me? Released on June 5th, 1937 by Mary Melodies, this is a short cartoon based on the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, after watching this one, I'm starting to realize that the more these cartoons rely on racism, the more their writing in general gets lazy. I mean, here we have a cartoon that takes up about half the runtime just introducing the characters. No, literally, half of the cartoon is just them explaining who they are and asking them if they're ready for the story. Ready, little Eva? You said it! <laughs> and you, cutie? Ain't time y'all say, Professor. Oh, do you want to be an actor? Oh, so, 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 oh. Dude, just so. get to the f***ing point. And it starts to feel like the reason is because they didn't have that much of a plot to go on in the first place. And the gags are so tired. They do the young girl who sounds older when she's mad gag. Believe her, you dope! And the most awkward of all is the Liza character, who for some reason goes into hysterics when she talks to the narrator. Are you from Dixie? Of course I'm from Dixie. Go on! Right and down! Have a look at the little flat I don't get the joke here. Is the joke that black folk go silly when they meet other people from the same place as them? Doesn't everyone to some extent get excited when you find out that you come from the same place as someone else? I hear it all the time when people are from New York. Like, hey, you're from 133rd and Lenox. Oh, no way. My uncle owns a brownstone on 144th and Broadway next to the coconut cart near Crenshaw Boulevard. Man, f*** you. New Yorkers. We then get to the plot as Simone is about to beat him because he's a sadistic bastard, and they feel that this sad reenactment of the realities of black Americans for centuries was the perfect time to make a fourth wall joke. My body might belong to you, but my soul belongs to Warner Brothers. Okay, I get that the joke is supposed to be that you expect him to say God there, but the subversion of expectation just doesn't work. Yeah, what are they trying to say there? You may think I belong to you, but I actually belong to other white people. Also, Uncle Tom isn't exactly a Warner Brothers exclusive character. Like, if this were Bugs Bunny, this gag would work. But since Uncle Tom is already a well-known old black man stereotype, this joke falls flat on its face. So the two little girls, Topsy and Little Eva, come along and stop Simon from whipping Uncle Tom by buying Uncle Tom off of him. Where the hell they got the money for that, I don't know. And it's so weird that this is supposed to be treated like a sweet moment. So, Topsy and Eva take Uncle Tom home. Had white people just not gotten it into their head that slavery was, like, unbelievably wrong? It's honestly kind of baffling how neutral their portrayal of slavery itself is. They're more just specifically against beating slaves. Like, yeah, kids, don't be like mean old Simone and beat your slaves. Sure, you're buying human beings, tearing them away from their families in order to make them do whatever you want against their will for no pay without a possibility of freedom. But, you know, don't be monsters about it. Anyway, time passes and Simo notices that the girls are behind on paying for Uncle Tom by three months because this evil, slimy, slave-beating snake is... For some reason, generous when it comes to payment deadlines and decides to take it back. Simon, si Simon, f it, I'm saying Simon, snoops around the house looking for Uncle Tom and feels around under a chair that he could clearly just look under instead. Which is an acceptable setup for me because at least his dumbass gets shocked. Liza then comes out of butt f nowhere, grabs the kids, and makes a break for it. As Simon gives chase with his dogs, and for some reason the writers thought it would be a great idea to portray a slave running away like a horse race. Liza through her rider. And the winner! And just when he catches up to her, who comes out of nowhere but Uncle Tom, in a fancy car with a fistful of cash, able to buy himself off of Simon. Where did he get this money, you ask? From gambling. Yep, what better way to resolve a plot inspired by racism than with more racism? Oh, and the dice are loaded too, because not only do those black people love them some gambling, they also love cheating! You know, this novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was supposed to be like, anti-racist? It was supposed to be an anti-racist book. Yeah. That's really weird that this is being like, co-opted in this cartoon by obvious racists. Is, Just to spew this... more racist bull****. Is this in the script? No, I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to make sure that was known. Seriously, this whole thing is a wash. Not only was it not that funny as a short, but it sets itself up like a parody of Uncle Tom's Cabin, even though it barely satirizes the original work. I mean, this is like epic movie levels of failure at parody. 
I don't even know if I can even call it that, though, because it barely even references the plot of it at all, other than the characters' names. It works more like a kid doing a book report of a novel that they didn't read and decided to just wing it. Literally, this feels like they took a completely different short story of two girls trying to buy a dog or something and put the Uncle Tom's cabin skin on it just to get people's attention. Just the fact that a plantation setting for a children's short was acceptable at a time when slavery had been abolished less than two generations ago is awkward as hell, and it's pretty damn shameful that they were so blindly insensitive to former slaves and their descendants. Next is Jungle Jitters. I can feel the shame through the title already. This cartoon was released on February 19th, 1938, and we're immediately greeted by the worst blackface since Al Jolson when we see the African natives. Seriously, this one hurts. For the first two minutes, it solidly relies on ridiculously exaggerated takes on native Africans. It's a failure of comedy because of perspective. Sure, if you absolutely know nothing about the history of imperialism and belittling of African peoples throughout European and American history, this may come off as innocent sight gags that just happen to be about an African tribe. But since this was intended for white children, and by extension a wide swath of white adults ignorant to the struggles of Africans and their descendants, that makes this more dangerous. Because white kids and those privileged enough to be insulated from black culture are the ones most likely to not know all that history, and so the dehumanization of Africans as not only the other, but as something to be flippantly mocked ingrains harsh misconceptions that they passively accept over time. Once they run out of sight gags though, they get to the plot where a traveling salesman is trying to sell modern inventions to the tribe. It gets a few laughs from a bit where the salesman desperately tries to get in, which gets resolved by the tribesmen seeing him as a chicken dinner and dragging him inside to eat him. Because, you know, they're all cannibals. And this stereotype might be lost on us now, but back then they were still knee-deep in a society that used exaggerated reports of cannibalism in native tribes as an excuse to push the agenda that African natives were savages that needed civilizing by white conquest. So, this is pretty f***ed up. They then take him to the queen, who is white? Man, is it just, like, impulsive for white people to cast themselves as the rulers of everything, even if it makes no sense? Now, someone who's naive might think that the white queen in an African tribe is for a gag that just happens to reinforce white imperialism, but in reality, this is another example of the Hayes Code in action. You see, there's a white guy who comes to the tribe to sell them stuff, and the queen falls in love with him, and as part of the code, it states no interracial kisses or flirtations, even in cartoons. What's going on out there? Oh, so, oh, we are having a salesman for dinner, please. What the? Why is that African guy doing a stereotypical Chinese accent? Dude, it's racism. It doesn't actually have to make sense. It's just supposed to make you angry. The queen then fantasizes that he's Clark Gable and Robert Taylor, which are apparently attractive men for that time, and she forces him into marriage. But when she goes to kiss him, he opts to be dinner instead. F this cartoon. F it straight to hell with a dirty dick. No one deserves to make a dime off of it. Any possible joke that could make you laugh is just caked in racist bull that makes any attempt at humor go down like a bonbon filled with razor blades. Well now. It's time to get to the island of Pingo Pongo. Oh god, I already know what to expect. More barely passable jokes sandwiched between horribly disparaging depictions of natives, which knocks the wind right out of the humor. Well, come on, let's get this bull out of the way. Canary Island. <laughs> that was actually kind of funny. It was pretty funny. Sandwich Island. Hey, that's pretty funny. Yeah, that was also pretty funny. And the Thousand Islands. <laughs> oh my god, that was hilarious! I don't see what's wrong with this one. We're about halfway through the video and it's been pretty funny. You know, I noticed a similar gag with the last cartoon. They both rely on doing something stereotypically tribal, quickly followed by an obvious American song. And the joke is literally just, What? They're not supposed to know this song. Doh. Like, maybe if this song had something to do with the Aborigines or Polynesia or whatever country they're supposed to be near, it would at least be relevant. Like, with the hummingbird just humming a song, the mockingbird imitating the narrator, there's a setup and a punchline, but there's no joke here. 
maybe if these were just birds and cats doing this, it'd be a passable moment. Like, okay, that was silly, and let's move on. But the fact that you actually have people that you draw in such an exaggerated way deflates the whole mood. It honestly feels like the marketing department stepped in and told them that their short required at least 10 to 15% racism in their yearly cartoon quota. And here we find a typical aborigine, completely untouched by civilization and totally ignorant of our presence. You know, this part is at least closer to being a funny joke. Like, the natives aren't supposed to have modern technology, but somehow he does. Ha ha. Although I'm not sure what the life goes to a party caption is supposed to mean. What does the phrase life goes to a party have to do with him taking a picture? Is he supposed to be going to a party? Because that hasn't really been established. And wait, he's the one taking the picture. And I'm assuming he's taking a picture of the tourists watching him, right? So... What does life goes to a party have to do with the tourists that he just took a picture of? I don't know. Maybe it's a reference lost to time. All I'll say is that I've noticed a recurring theme that when the writers lazily rely on race for laughs, all the peripheral joke writing seems to go down with it. It's like a lazy, perpetual downward spiral of humor. No, seriously, look at this part that happens next and tell me where the joke is supposed to be. Typical of the island life are the... Hey! I'm sorry, folks. I'm sure I don't know how that got in here. Oh, well. The favorite island sport. Get it? Because I f don't. And then they go into three different musical numbers because that's just what you do when you have no actual jokes left. Although oddly enough, the drums are interrupted by a slow waltz number, quickly followed by a minute and a half jazz number. Because although white people seemed to love jazz music back then, for some reason they couldn't help but to refer to it as the music of savages. Oh yeah, and then we have the character of Egghead, who pops up in the cartoon several times carrying a banjo case, asking, is it time now, only for the narrator to keep telling him no. But then, when we reach the end of the cartoon, for after all the times he interrupted the announcer, this gag was a build-up to... <laughs> Him shooting the sun. They really did not know how to end this, did they? Perpetual downward spiral of humor. Well, that wasn't so bad, was it? Jess, that was literally so bad. Well, you know, we're only about halfway through, right? So we'll see you guys next time. God, kill me now.